good to catch up on comments by doing one of these response videos. Now you may be wondering why I do response videos at all. Why not just go through each individual comment and, and just type things up? Well, when it comes to typing comments, I'm a little slower than I would be just verbally. I think often my verbal dexterity is better than my ability to write out comments and be concise because I, that's what I try to do is be as concise as possible with the comments. Whereas I can take two or three minutes and answer a comment very quickly in a way that would take me five or six minutes to answer it. If I was trying to be concise and try to clean up the, the wording and everything. And so that's, it's easier for me. So I want to talk about three ways that you can actually get in contact me, with me if you have some type of question. Uh, the first way is through the comments. So many of you are already doing that. Uh, the second way is actually you can email me. And so let me, if you go to my channel, you can find um, under, I think it's Jerry Lee PhD and two other. Yeah, so you can go there. It shows my website, my Substack. And then you can go to my email address and here it is right here, jswoffordjr at gmail.com. You should have access to that if you have not been able to see that before. This is my email. This is my personal email. You can email me there if you, if you have questions. I know some of you probably have questions and maybe you don't want to go in the comments with it and put it out in the open. Maybe you're uh, an atheist or agnostic and you're kind of shifting and you don't necessarily want to put yourself out there and you have questions about, about uh, the existence of God or about the inspiration of the Bible that you would rather talk about privately, then that's one good way to get in, in touch with me. The third way is do, going live on YouTube. And this is, uh, I have not done this before, but there's the, the ability to go live and take comments in real time and answer your comments. So if you're, you're saying, Hey, this guy's a Christian robotics engineer, and he is really interested in apologetics. So I'd like to know what he thinks about this, this, or this. If that's something that you would be interested in, I just showed you my email address. If you would like to email me and put in the title of the email, interested in YouTube live apologetics discussion or something like that. If we have enough people, if we have five or 10 people, let's say, it would be easy for me next week, for instance, to figure out a time that works and to go live. So if you are interested in that, but you're, you're in England or something, I believe England is six hours ahead of where I am in Huntsville, Alabama, in the central standard time region of the United States. Then if you're six hours ahead, then if I go live at seven o'clock at night for you, that's one in the morning and you're not going to be able to watch it. So if, if in that email you say, Hey, I'd, I'd be interested in a discussion like that. Uh, please let me know. Okay. What, what are the times if you can, if you don't mind converting it to my time, time region. So central standard time and what times are good for you. And maybe there are certain days that are good for you. And if I get enough emails to do that, then I'll, we'll, we'll do a live next week and you'd be able to ask questions in real time and see me respond to different people's questions. Also, if you are interested in such a discussion and you have a specific question that you'd like me to address in that live then please put that in there as well. And so if, if it ends up there, there's like three people that do it, there would be no reason for us to go live. We could just do a zoom call. And so then we would just all be able to talk in a zoom call with just four of us. But if there's really more than when it, when it gets past four or five people in a zoom, it just makes a lot more sense on my end to just say, okay, we'll do a live. And all of these people can, I can respond to these different questions. People can get in the chat and actually ask me more questions. So if that's something you think you'd be interested in, uh, please uh, go uh, email me about that in the next few days, and we'll see about doing an apologetics discussion next week. And again, this is not just believers. If you're an atheist and you're kind of saying, hey, I want to know what you think about this or that, fine. I also want to say, before I go into these uh, comments again, that sometimes people are coming with a lot of hostility and anger, and I get it because these are important topics. What I'm trying to do as much as possible when I'm doing these live is show you that there is no hostility toward you, that often I'm laughing off things. And there are some people that are saying, well, why are you laughing? And it's like, well, sometimes there are things that 
in my estimation, seem ridiculous that are being said. It's not that the people are ridiculous, but that the things being said are sometimes ridiculous to me and, and they catch me off guard. My genuine reaction is to my general reaction is, is to chuckle at things like that. There was somebody talking about moonwalk, uh, Jesus moonwalking on water. I thought that was funny, but then the person came back in another comment and said something like, well, it's good that you are laughing about something that's a mythology. And I'm going, okay, see, now you, now you want me to, I got, we can get serious about this, but, um, and so I proceed to say, no, we're, we're serious. Jesus actually did walk on water. He did not moonwalk on water. He walked. And so, and so that's, and so that's what I would say to that, I, that I want to be able to demonstrate that there's no hostility on my side. I, I, you think I'm mistaken most likely. And I think you are, you're mistaken. And what we're trying to do is get to the truth. All right. So right now this is saying that I'm at 13 comments that have not been responded to. Um, I'm doing a bunch of housekeeping stuff right now, but I also want to say there's some of you that are might maybe say, Hey, I commented on, on your video back on Tuesday or on Monday, and you didn't comment back yet. I've been busy. And so I am not a full-time content creator. There was somebody that seemed to think I was, I am not a full-time content creator. Again, I'm a robotics engineer. I'm an entrepreneur. I'm uh, doing other things during the day. And so there, yeah, I don't, this is, uh, this doesn't mean that this doesn't matter. It just means that specifically responding to comments, which takes energy and effort. I want to make sure I'm at a place where I can do that. And I have some time this morning, so we're going to do that now. All right. And let's just be real. Like a lot of the comments are quite, um, negative. And so I'm not particularly, um, looking forward to responding to a bunch of negative comments. So if you are someone who is more positive in your comments, I, I had last week, there was this really pleasant back and forth that I had with somebody and I thought was really helpful. And I was looking forward to coming to the comments, uh, uh, to talk to this person, but that has not been, um, the case in a lot of cases. So what we'll do is we will start taking a look at people's comments. And so let's see, hide this. Now I'm only seeing one, two, three, four, five. There's okay. There's one person, Ethel red that has a bunch of these comments and, and so the, uh, and so this is, you earn your living with long videos. So again, I don't know what, so I've got to go back and answer some of these. So, so, so again, so here's a person who's, so, so I want to give you a sense of what's happening here. This person that I have not seen any comments. I've not looked at any comments in two, in Whenever the last time I did the, the last response video, which was probably Tuesday night, I think something like that, I haven't looked at any comments since then. So you're having somebody say, Hey, tell me where this evidence is. If you want me to watch this video, um, timestamp please. And then science literally began with living in a land that did allow non-believers. So you started badly while quoting me. I don't know what that's talking about. Timestamps as you wasted beginning and irrelevancy. Did you know that the first science paper was from a Muslim or that Newton did not believe in the Trinity or an afterlife timestamp? Okay. Uh, so there's probably some previous comment that I'm not seeing, but again, you're seeing what I'm seeing, that it's saying that these are the five that I have not responded to, but you just saw earlier that there were 13 comments that had not been responded to. So. I'm not, what is held for review? There's nothing there. So again, published comments that I have not responded to is, is I'm seeing five. I'm trying to scroll. I'm only seeing five. So you're, you're seeing in real time, what I'm seeing, I have to go back and, um, go, uh, I have to go back and try to figure out what, um, Ethel red, hard red, hard read, hard read is saying. And, uh, so you have something like John Murphy here. Um, no, the story is a fairy tale. Okay. Like we can respond to, to those, uh, again, it, it is, 
not a fairy tale, but that is an assertion. I, I that is a a valid way of of thinking about the the story. What I would say is, when you do look at if you read Genesis one and two, it doesn't read like a fairy tale. And so that's what I would say simply to that comment. Read Genesis one and two, and you tell me whether that sounds like a fairy tale or an account of what the author. And you may disagree with the author, but fairy tales are my understanding. I don't watch a lot of Disney or that kind of thing, but once upon a time in a land far away, this, this and this, um, and there are these, there's this sense of everybody knows that's not a real story. It's a fairy tale. When you read Genesis one in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth and the earth was without form and void and darkness was over the face of the deep and the spirit of God moved over the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. There was no, there's no sense there of fairies or there it's not written as if a tale it is written as an account a narrative account which is why in that video i talked about the fact that that account is referring to literal days there's no sense there uh, that those days are not literal and i'm not sure how else moses could have written it he says and there was evening and there was morning day one and there was evening and there was morning the second day and it goes on that way through the six days of creation and so I don't know how else he would have said it. And as we saw in that video, we went back to Exodus chapter 20. So fairy tale, there's, it's an account and you may disagree with it, but then my question becomes, what is your response to this? And we'll probably come back to this uh, several times in this video, but uh, in the previous video, I kind of stumbled across this, uh, the, there are these three ideas that you people generally claim happened. Uh, the Big Bang, abiogenesis, and evolution. And it spells the word bay. Like, you know, people will say, you know, talk about their girlfriend and call her bay, or girls might call their, their boyfriend bay. And so there's this word bay that is formed from Big Bang, abiogenesis, and evolution. And what I'm saying is, I'm saying it's God. You're saying it's bay. Now, which one is it? And so it's easy for you to try to tear down the concept of God and, and me speaking of it of a creator, but let's talk about what you believe as well. And if you don't believe Bay, if you don't believe big bang, abiogenesis and evolution, I'd be interested to hear what you believe. But if you're believing big bang, abiogenesis and evolution, you tell me how that's not a fairy tale. Tell me how let's talk about big bang to start. Big bang is there was nothing and then matter, time and energy exploded into existence from nothing. There was no cause. There was just nothing. And then all of a sudden matter, time and energy exploded into existence. Now, if we're talking about fairy tales here, we're talking about things that don't happen. That sounds like a fairy tale. Next, the A, abiogenesis. Abiogenesis says, there was non-living matter and then it came to life. Don't know how, but that's just what happened. Now in our extended and universal experience, we never see living things come to life from non-life. It is always living things that give rise to other living things. That's the law of biogenesis, by the way. And just to mention for the first part, the idea of matter and energy being created. The, the first law of thermodynamics says that energy is neither created nor destroyed. And so to, to speak of Big Bang, you're talking about something that breaks the first law of thermodynamics. So the second part breaks the law of biogenesis. The third part is evolution. We've talked significant. We've talked quite a bit about that because it is so foreign. The idea of mutations and natural selection being, well, mutation specifically being good is just not what we see. Mutations are close to universally harmful for organisms. What is a mutation? It is a corruption of the genetic information uh, that, is, uh, that is being copied. And so if there's a corruption, <laughs> like when we're describing this thing, we're talking about corruption, we're talking about mutation. And then we're saying that these mutations brought about new and 
beneficial traits, attributes, structures in organisms. That is not what we see. So you can believe in Bay if you want to. I will choose to believe in God. And if you believe in Bay, then please explain this idea of you believing in ideas that break the break laws of thermodynamics. Because by the way, evolution is opposed to the second law of thermodynamics. Things do not gradually get better over time as we observe. And so there is something called genetic entropy, which is not thermodynamic, but the idea of entropy comes from the second law of thermodynamics. And there's an idea of genetic entropy that is being violated when you say that an accumulation of mutations actually makes an organism improve over time. That's not what we see. We see an accumulation of mutations makes organisms not improve over time. And so if someone were to tell you that your child had a mutation on this certain gene, you don't get happy about it. They're telling you that because there's some kind of ab abnormality or problem that is the result of that mutation. But these people are trying to tell you that a bunch of mutations together gave rise to improvements in these different organisms. But that's not what we observe. So all three of these ideas rail against what we actually observe. On the other hand, we are saying that God is the one who created matter, time, and energy. So not nothing, we're saying God did it. We're saying that God, a living being, created life, which is what we see. We see life give rise to more life. That's what we see. Abiogenesis says non-living matter, then it pops into being alive. That's not what we observe. And on the, and on the other hand, God creating different kinds of creatures at the very beginning. And that over time, genetic entropy is accumulating and things are being becoming less fit for their environment as a result. What we don't see is things getting better because of mutations. That's just not what we see. We see things running down. And so this idea of entropy is, in, is, is actually in the scripture, that the earth is running down from what it was originally created to be. And we see that in the world, but in this case, we're being told that things are getting better because of evolution. But that's just not what we observe. Okay, so that's Bay and that's God. That's the fundamental dichotomy here. And so we can talk about geology, we can talk about these different things. And so at 711, I am denying real evidence and the real science of geology. So again, I don't know what that I I, I would have to go back to 711 to see. Um, and it is and geology is not dependent on unverified assumptions. Think about that statement for a second. Unverified assumptions. If it's verified, it's not an assumption. There are things that you're going to assume that are impossible to verify or not. There, there can be things that are, I guess, verified assumptions. But again, the idea that geology is based on verified assumptions, again, it, by on its face, you can't verify something when you don't know, when you were not present. How can you verify these geological assumptions when you were not present? What's the verification? There is none. So you can just, so you can say it's not based on unverified assumptions, but it's just not true. And so the great flood was disproved by Christians in the early 1800s. That is a fact. Where's this proof? And these, these are the kinds of assertions that are being made here. And so again, still no timestamp. I'm coming. <laughs> I don't know that I'm going to put a bunch of timestamps in here because I don't know what you're asking for, but I will... We're going to go now to the, the video and we're going to see, oh, these are all from that, that one video. So what was, these four comments were from that one video. So then what is this? Oh, this was the response video. So I want to go to this video first. And so, no, the story is a fairy tale. Hey, that, that's a. Uh, I don't know that I say it. like the person who just wanted to comment. I, I may say something back. Um, like what, what do you respond back to someone who comments on your channel? I believe this thing. They come to my channel. 
they say, no, it's a fairy tale. <laughs> um, it's not a fairy tale, but um, my question would probably be something like this. Have you read the Genesis one account? Does it read like a, uh, it doesn't read like a fairy tale to me. Right. So again, I, I, I'm trying to engage people because I think I, I'm generally finding people that actually haven't read the accounts. So you just listen to what I'm saying and then you haven't read it. And so then there's this person saying you have this long video <clears throat> so you can make money or something. I I'm not monetized on YouTube. So there is no, so let's go to the, let's go to this video. This is where I think the majority um, comments are probably right. So we're going to sort by, I don't want to sort by newest first. I would just, um, yeah. So, so much cringe. <laughs> um, let's just go down through here first and then see if there are other comments as well. So Christian ice says here, uh, and we're going to try to go quicker than maybe I usually do. I already took way too. I'm already 20 minutes in. We're going to try to be less than an hour. And again, if, I get it, right? If you don't want to watch the entire thing, I, I get it. But I am. there are some people that are interested in this kind of thing. And how do we answer? How does a Christian answer these people um, who are disagreeing? And how in the sense of what kinds of answers do you give, but also what is the temperament? And so just understand that there is no, there's no hatred. There's no hostility here. I, I just, um, we're trying to help you see the truth. Um, so Christian, I says, um, it's not, it's a story invented. So this is similar to the fairy tale idea. Um, who in his right mind would think that men had any idea at that time. So th again, there's this idea that if I think that people understood some things back then, that I must not be in my right mind. And I don't think Christian ice is trying to be, be insulting. I, I don't know that everybody, I don't think people are trying to be, maybe they are, maybe they just, Maybe I'm just being naive and, and people really are trying to insult me and I'm just kind of saying, well, maybe they just don't realize it. But, um, in this case, um, I just said, Hey, thanks for the comment. Um, I understand that many people are skeptical of the Bible. Have you read it? Um, yes. From cover to cover. That's when I lost my faith. Uh, many people are. And so this person right here, boots can Chelsea's. So I'm so. Um, yes, from cover to cover, that's when I lost my faith. Okay. What was it uh, that you would point to that, that made you lose faith? Because he's essentially saying that by reading the scriptures, he lost faith. So I'm curious, what was it that you would point to that you would say made you lose faith? This is an inter this is an interesting discussion. So, um, hopefully, we'll be able to um, kind of continue from there. Um, but this person, many people are skeptical of the Bible because it is a collection of baseless assertions and uneducated nonsense. So you've read it. Okay, so that's it for those. Um, let's go to here next. Um, so one of the things that uh, Daniel T says that was interesting is that he studied the de debate for a decade. We saw that before. And he says, I haven't heard an argument that could get me to a theistic God, much less the specific God of the Bible. My response to this was to say, hey, design arguments for God's existence appeal to me because of my engineering background, but a different argument might be more persuasive for you. I understand why a deistic or pantheistic God would be more palatable to you as an atheist, but it isn't clear to me why the existence of such a God would be more probable for you than a theistic one. Is it that a theistic God is less likely to exist or is it that such a God would be less appealing? So what I'm getting at here is that there is a difference between taste. I, 
I just don't like the God of the Old Testament, for instance. This is something that people often say. I don't like the God of the Old Testament. Now, my, my question to you is, it would be this. It's like me saying, for instance, I don't like that. I would not say this, but if, if someone were to say, I don't like that atheists exist, so I'm just going to completely ignore them and not be around them. And so it's like they don't, <laughs> it's like they're not really around. Just because you don't like something doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. So you might say, I don't like or agree with the actions of the God of the Old Testament. But that has nothing to do with whether he exists or not. If I look back in history and I, I see people, historical figures that I don't care for, it doesn't mean you, you can sometimes see people who reject the uh, the evidence of, of, the of the Holocaust and the existence of Hitler and these different guys and say how this was just all made up. And, and I would I would think that part of that is because they don't it's 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 distasteful. It's not pal palatable. I, I'm going to get these words out. <laughs> it's not palatable. It's not it's not tasteful. I don't believe that because of that, rather than saying, hey, what does the evidence say, no matter what my tastes are? And so that's what I was kind of getting at there. Now, I don't know if this person, Daniel T, actually ever answered back. Maybe he answered back somewhere else, um, but he hasn't answered back to it. So this person says um, appeal has nothing to do with it. There is no verifiable for and again, this is the Ethel Red Hard Red who's like, commented four times on the response video. So um, appeal has nothing to do with it. There is no verifiable for any God and all testable gods fail testing. There was no great flood. So the God of Genesis does not exist. Maybe some other gods, but not that one. So so this is this is what's what's there seems to be specifically a, des a desire to say no. It might be some other gods, but not that one. It might be some deistic or pantheistic God, but not the, not the true, not the one I'm telling you is the true God. And, and so the question is, appeal has nothing to do with it. Um, this is not a complete sentence. So in the sense that there is no verifiable, I guess they mean verifiable evidence uh, for any God and all testable gods fail testing. So. There's a statement that gets made several times. There was no great flood. Okay, so there is a great deal of evidence all over the earth uh, that there was a great flood. Now, I'm I'm clearly going to need to do a video on this because there's there this keeps getting said, and I it, I think it I I'm getting the sense of why a lot of apologetics channels and other people that are talking about this. Uh, and specifically young earth creation, why they bring up the great flood so much, because I haven't really talked a whole lot about it. I guess I have some, but the reason why I think it gets brought up is because it really shapes how you view geology. And if you go into the, into a study of geology and you say this, then how you view things changes. Then if you say there was a great flood. And so if there was a great flood, you have to completely look at the evidence differently. And this gets back to assumptions. And so the person earlier, I think it was the same person said something about verifiable assumptions in geology. And the point is that again, this idea of a verifiable assumption, to me, what we do is we make assumptions and then we try to look and see if those assumptions line up with the things that we are now seeing. Now you might call that being verified, but again, if we see marine life in fossil form on tops of mountains, what, what do you, what do you do with that evidence? And we do see this around the world. What, what, um, ethyl red hardred, um, when we see marine fossils all over the world on tops of mountains, how do you explain that? Now the scriptures say that there was a great flood that covered the tops of the mountains. So it would make sense that there would be marine fossils up there, and that's what we find. But if there never was that great flood, how do you explain marine fossils on tops of mountains? So that's a specific question for those who would say there's not been a great flood. And you say, well, Jerry, there weren't really marine fossils on tops of mountains. Please look it up. 
and I'll be making a video on it soon. So I will, I don't know how soon soon is, but I will be making a video on this. And so you clearly have not been told this and I can tell you why you haven't been told this. If people are atheistic, why would they talk about that? They just wouldn't. And I'm not saying somebody's keeping something from you, but it would be pointing to a completely different worldview. So why would you even be looking for that? You wouldn't. So we will, we will certainly need to do a video on that. So this person says maybe some, so because I'm going to be responding to this particular person elsewhere, I would just say, I'll respond somewhere else. I'm not going to respond to that comment. Um, this person also comments quite a bit on my, on my stuff. So they're commenting on someone else's. I would again say, Hey, I would, I'm, I'm, I'm really trying to go back to Daniel T's question because I think it's a genuine question and it's somebody who's actually studied this. So I'm interested in those, like, I'm not interested in trying to, th there's this uh, portrayal that I'm trying to deceive people or lie to people. Well, if I, if that's the case, then what I would do is I would go after people who just don't understand anything. No, no. I want to talk to the person that studied for a decade. Like those are the people I want to talk to because I'm not, because I, when you understand that's something to be true. I don't need to try to pick out people that are like, that's what, that's what deceivers do. Deceivers are not looking for somebody that studies this. So I'm really interested in what he says. Some of the other people that are just throwing things out there saying there was no great flood. Okay. Here's one piece of evidence you should look up marine fossils on tops of mountains. Now I can explain why that that's there. I'd be interested to hear yours. I saw another one the other day. The, um, here's, here's a second one, by the way, there, there are these rock arches. This was interesting. Again, I don't care as much about the geology stuff, but there's some interesting stuff to it. There are these rock arches back out in the desert where it, what it looks like is, let's see if I can find one. Um, rock arches. So you have these rock arches here like this where you have rock and there's a hole through it basically and the question is how does something like that form because the way it the way it's designed or how do I want to say designed the way it appears to be designed I'm not saying it's designed I'm saying it formed but the way it's structured is the word I'm looking for this part at the top is what kind of holds the entire thing together. So it is not something that could have through sedimentary layers built up over time. And then somehow this other side built up over time and then they kind of got closer and closer together. And then the top built up over time. It, it, that doesn't make sense geologically. And so how, how does that happen? How does such a thing like that happen? Well, the, the easiest way to think of this is to think about that all of this at one time wasn't, was more whole. And there was some kind of stream that went through it. And that, that is what caused that arch. So when you think about a great flood water covering much higher than this, a stream of water could have pressed its way through there, caused that, and then it hardens into the rock arches that we are seeing out in the desert. Well, that's actually a plausible explanation for rock arches that I saw someone talking about, uh, saw some believers talking about that said, hey, that's evidence that there was a flood out there. Because if you think about the, the desert, how, how do you explain that rock arch? So th those are two. I don't want to give like 15. I, I'd like um, Ethel Red Hardred to, to specifically talk to marine fossils on tops of mountains and rock arches, right? And maybe there is some plausible explanation of how that built, but some type of sedimentary layer by layer over time building of a rock arch, because we don't see, they're all old. So we don't see any that build over time. So, so the question is, okay, these things formed thousands of years ago, but how? And so the sedimentary idea doesn't work there. So those would be two. Answer those and and we will continue from there and, and we'll probably give some others uh, in a different video. Um,
So again, this person is, uh, um, is just, is quoting me and saying, Hey, I said, and I said that up here, that design, or I said it here, design arguments for God's existence appeal to me because of my engineering background, but a different argument might be pr more persuasive for you. Yeah. An evident and demonstrably true argument would be much, much more persuasive than an antiquated bronze age tribal assertion without any foundation. In fact, um, I think maybe this person commented elsewhere, but I'm, I'm fine with just simply pointing out, how do you explain the apparent design? in the human body. It's very simple. How do you explain the apparent design in the human body? Because it is apparent. So we want to talk about evident, demonstrably true. It is evident and demonstrably true that the human body has been designed. It is a system of systems. And you can go as small as you want to, as microscopic level as you want to. You want to go on the level of cells, molecules. You'll see information there. So we see a system of systems over and over again. My training is in engineering design. I have a PhD in mechanical engineering. What I observe is a system of systems. And a system of systems requires design because if you don't, if it just somehow pop, if you just somehow have some system of systems that hasn't been put together well, it won't work. The human body works very well. And I know that there are these distillological arguments that say it's badly designed. Even if I were to go with you on that, a bad design is still design. Anybody looking at the human body sees design. And what you can do with that is say, well, it just looks like it's designed. And that's fine. But I'm saying, I'm telling you as an engineer, that's my, that's my background. So geology is not my background. Biology is not my background. Engineering design is my background. And what I'm telling you is that's design. That's verifiable. That is demonstrable. That is evident that you won't, you don't have a system that works that has not been designed to work. You just don't. And so there are plenty of parts to that. How do you explain? the apparent design in the human body? Simple question. All right, so uh, you have to show the possibility of something before you can consider what is more probable between those possible choices. The starting point is non-belief, not any form of deism or theism. You then must meet and beat a burden of proof to believe. Epistemo epistemolog epistemological rigor when applied correctly would not allow for such false dichotomies as you're presenting. What false dichotomy is being presented? I don't know. See, see what happens is, um, you, you can say things like you presented false dichotomies and you can use the big word like epistemological rigor. And I'll, I'll admit I'm not some, uh, philosopher to, to, to look up, uh, to, to say what that word is, but the idea of that, the starting point is non-belief, not any form of deism or theism. Um, you have to show the possibility of something before you can consider what is more probable between those possible choices. Okay. Um, to me, there's theism, there's atheism. And so what is the false dichotomy? There's a God, there's not a God that I don't see that as a false dichotomy. And my point is that when you begin to go down from there not being a God, there become all of these. Um, so, so, so the starting point is non-belief. No, see that's And so that's the, that's, and this is good. Uh, J Jack Kandar painting. This is good because it reveals the bias. See the bias is not, there may be a God, there may not be a God. You're saying the starting point is there is not a God. And that, that, that must be the starting point. And I'm saying it's not. The starting point is, I don't know, is the starting point. And so we examine God, we examine no God, and we look at the, 
the, at the consequences of each. But you notice if you if you must start from no God, you're already biased. And I'm saying don't be biased. And so you can talk about epistemological rigor. You can talk about that. It's not a false dichotomy to say God or no God. That's the dichotomy. That's the dilemma. So zoom out and say, okay, God or no God. And as we've just mentioned, God, I see a super intelligence who has created the world. We see design in the world. The existence of God is certainly possible, right? It's certainly possible to look at design in the world and say that there is a super intelligence that could have done this. So, so we, so let's start there. Now, if I go to know God, I'm still willing to tell you that that's possible, but let's look at what happens. We come up with ideas like big bang, abiogenesis, evolution, which are, if, if not anti-scientific or non-scientific are pseudoscientific. And so what I'm saying is that is, this, this is really good because to say that the starting point is non-belief shows the, the bias. The starting point should be more like what I, what we would call the agnostic. The starting point is to zoom out and say, I don't know, God, no God is the dichotomy. Now let's compare. That's not what you're doing. You're saying that the starting point is non-belief. And if the starting point is non-belief, then you fundamentally are biased. The starting point should be, I don't know. So let's look at both. But what happens is if you begin from non-belief, instead of beginning in the center or from a neutral position, and this kind of gets back to what the presuppositional guys would say, well, see, there you go. But this is what I'm getting at. That's bias. So you're showing your bias, but then trying to say something like, oh, well, then you must meet and beat a burden of proof to believe. And what I'm saying is you've got God on one side, you've got no God on one side. So the no God that need, you need to be able to show, hey, that there is, there are viable, there's a viable series of consequences if there was no God, like that scientifically that would make some sense. But when you have these incoherent scientific ideas that are re the result of atheism, well, how do you explain that? Is what is the burden of proof there? But you're saying, I don't need to have any proof to be at non-belief. You see, you're, that's not, that's, that's biased. So it's not a false dichotomy. And I know that it's, it, that's what you've been told, but even not being a philosopher, you can, you can see what I'm saying here. You've, you've created what I've, what I mentioned earlier before even seeing this comment that people are already on one side biased against the other and then saying, well, you need to show me something, but you're not in the middle. You're not actually neutral. You're on the other side. And then saying you're being neutral, you're not being, that's not neutral. That's not neutrality. You're actually on the other side. And so we could come up with all kinds of, 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 of parallels to this, right? But we don't need to, we, that shows the, the bias there. And so that will, um, I didn't present some false dichotomy and I'll probably maybe link to this part of the video because this is, this is so relevant. Okay. Do you really think, uh, Moses wrote Genesis? So this is Daniel T, which is actually the same person up here that gave this really cool comment where he's saying, Hey, I've studied this. Um, you can generally get a skeptic to a deistic God, but I haven't really heard anything to get me to a, to a theistic God. And I appreciated the comment. I think I liked it myself. Um, so again, I can like a comment that I disagree with that, that I disagree with the conclusion. Like people are like, that, again, there's, there's no hostility here. If you, if you have a thoughtful comment, I don't mind liking it. I might not say love because I don't agree, but like, I'll like the comment. I appreciate it. And so, um, so down here, do you really think Moses wrote Genesis? So there are like 11, um, replies to that. So let me get to that in a second, but down here, um, so much cringe. <laughs> 
Uh, no, maybe you'll say what, what the cringe was. I replied here, all the lies y'all tell to accept a Bronze Age, Iron Age myth from the Levant is crazy. I think of a lie as a statement that the speaker knows to be untrue. Can you give an example of a lie being told here? What do you think I'm saying that I don't believe? That the earth was created in six days. There was three days and three ni and nights without a sun or a moon and a man came from a woman's rib. Uh, yeah, I don't know what that means. And here comes this person. You can tell a lie and still believe it. So, so then you're defining lie differently. So, so my thing is I'm saying, I believe those things. So I, you might think I'm miss, but I believe those things. You might think that I am misguided. but that isn't the same as lying. And then you can tell a lie and still believe it. Okay. Like this person, <laughs> this person is jumping in on all the, all the, everything I'm saying. Uh, so this person says, congrats on shortening your video. Now take the next step and just say, God did it. Boom. You are done. I thanks for the comment. I'll talk about how God did it makes it, a lot more sense than Bay did it. Big Bang, abiogenesis, evolution here. I talk about how God did it. Makes a lot more sense. Okay, so this this is the same person. <laughs> hey, Boots, you should come. Like you should email me so you can get on the uh, on the live. So we could like we could talk straight up because um, you're really in these comments. I tell you, and so actually that shows that you're being willfully ignorant about the most basic scientific concepts. So you believe that matter, energy, and time popped into existence from nothing. The Big Bang. So I will comment on that. So you believe that matter, energy, and time popped into existence from nothing. The Big Bang. So, so th think about what you're saying. These are basic scientific concepts. <laughs> you believe matter, energy, and time popped into existence from nothing. Okay. So do you really think Moses wrote Genesis? So there's like 11 replies here. I don't even remember why. I don't even remember there being, so I have to go back and see. I said, yes, the Pentateuch or Torah composed of the books of Genesis through Deuteronomy has been attributed to Moses. Where am I on time? Okay. Like I want to keep these right at around an hour at the most. So if I need to come back and respond to another video, maybe tomorrow we'll, we'll cause I, I haven't even gotten around to the, um, video where I responded to this video. I haven't even gotten to those comments yet. I just really wanted to get to the, but it says that there are, hold on. It says there are 47 comments. So this one in three replies is four. This one in four replies is five. So that's nine, 11. That would be 23, 26, 31, 35, 37. It still looks like I'm missing something. If it says that I'm seeing 37 comments, not 47. So, um, we'll, we'll try something else in a second. I want to try to get to all the comments on this particular video. All right. So, um, again, Mana Mana the Great is also someone who is the person that down here said so much cringe. And uh, we're having a discussion on another thread. We're trying, he's trying to defend the claim that the Torah, so like there's another, so yeah, he's on another thread, Mana Mana the Great, all the while claiming not to be arguing from a presuppositional position. But yeah, so that's, that's, that's up here. So that must be this thread. So we're going to get on this thread and then that's probably all I got time for today. So, um, cause it's like, why, how are there 11 replies on this? I, so I guess, um, okay. So I say, so it doesn't bother you that it was written in third. So man, of man of the great, again, I don't know if Daniel T does Daniel T say anything here. 
I don't think Daniel T even is coming back. Like I'm wanting Daniel T who studied this. I, I'm wanting him to, to maybe jump in, <laughs> but that's fine. So it doesn't bother you that it was written in third person. Numbers 12, three is a ridiculous verse. Numbers 12, three, by the way, is Moses uh, saying that he's, uh, he's saying that Moses, it, the scripture says that Moses was the meekest man in the earth. And it's a ridiculous verse. Again, this gets back to you begin not from a place of neutrality. You begin from a place of non-belief, unbelief. That's not neutral. And so, so that's your, that's the issue here. You, you should be begin from neutrality. If you're, if, if that's what you want to go with, you want to begin with from neutrality and then you move towards belief or unbelief. But if you go in and say something's ridiculous, oh, okay. You already have a, a belief system and that's fine. But, um, and so I don't, so again, there's a misunderstanding of what presuppositional apologetics means. Here's what I mean by presupp presuppositional apologetics. Let me explain it again. As far as I can tell, it seems to mean, and again, that may not be it. I think maybe you're explaining it in a different way. My understanding is that presuppositional apologetics really goes more off of, I'm going to show you that your worldview is incorrect. And if you're not willing to accept that, then we just don't proceed as far as I can tell. So in that case, I am essentially wanting you to accept the viability, let's say, of the Christian worldview over an atheistic worldview before we really proceed further. And I'm saying I'm fine with you not agreeing on that. And let's just examine but there are concepts from that that I obviously use. I'm going to show where I have opportunity. Hey, your worldview disagrees with science here. Bay disagrees with science. So what do you do with that? Because what I'm saying doesn't disagree with science. A God creating matter, time, and energy sounds a lot more plausible than nothing creating matter, time, and energy. A living being producing more life is more plausible than non-living matter producing life, something we have not been able to duplicate and have been trying for decades, by the way. And then something like, again, this, this, uh, this ignoring of genetic entropy and somehow just saying that mutations uh, building up over time actually makes things better. Corruption of information produces more information. These are the kinds of things that are being said from this macroevolutionary worldview, and it's not what happens in science. So what do you do with that? So that, that's, that's the question. And so he's like, you're a presuppositional apologist. And so um, you mentioned several things here. It's tempting to apply our 21st century sensibilities to writings from thousands of years ago, but I believe that would be a mistake. Of course, we wouldn't write in third person, but our excessive modern use of the first person would likely seem ridiculous to ancient people. So, so think about that for a second. This is one of the things that he's hung up on is, I think it's a he. If it's not, please let me know <laughs> if you're not a he. But um, the, you're, you're hung up on third person, the use of third person. And you're applying this to a book written thousands of years ago. And so my thing is, well, we'll talk about it in a second. But the, the second thing is um, here that if Moses is the author of the Torah, that although Moses is the author of the Torah, there are some footnotes and editorial statements in it. So like Numbers in twelve, Numbers 12.3 12, and Deuteronomy 34.10. Now, by the way, I actually don't think that Numbers 12.3 is an editorial statement, but what I'm saying is there are there can be editorial statements in it and footnotes in it, and that does not negate the authorship of the Torah. And so, for example, I'm I, here I would say just Deuteronomy 34.10, but I'm just mentioning both of these because he kind of puts them together. Um, but Deuteronomy, like, if you say, well, no, that could not have been written by Moses. If it, if it was, then it's just simply an editorial statement, but that doesn't mean that Moses didn't write the book. So if a scribe wrote, if Samuel, the prophet or the Samuel, the judge was, um, copying down the Torah and he put in there that about Moses, that doesn't mean that Moses didn't write the entirety of the Torah. We're really talking about a couple of verses here, and that must mean he didn't write any of it. And I think that's that's misguided. So 
Um, they, these may have been added later, right? And so specifically Deuteronomy 34.10, this obituary of Moses, likely added later. That doesn't mean that when you look at all of the chapters of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, now he didn't write any of it because someone added an obituary at the end. Even in the 21st century, if we, if we add footnotes or brief statements for clarification, if we add that to a reprint of an old book, nobody says that the reprinted book by Napoleon Hill or whoever had additional authors. Now, if you add a bunch of stuff to it, then yeah, that's, there's an additional author. But in this case, you're talking about a couple of verses and saying that now he must not have written any of it. We're on time. Okay. I need to, I need to be done in about 10 minutes or so. Okay. So I basically go through that you know, when books are published posthumously, it's not the author that published it. Somebody else did, but no one says, oh, well, it wasn't this person. And so even if there are, again, maybe bits and pieces that are added for clarity, you don't say that those per, the, per, the editor that added that, oh, that's another author to the book. You just don't do that. And they certainly would not have done that in ancient times. Okay. Let's say for that it were true that he made this statement that there's no evidence he even existed outside of being a character in the stories. Now, again, let's say that that's true. I don't know of any historians that go, well, there actually wasn't anybody named Moses. And what you would have now, and you would have the burden of proof here, because if we're saying, hey, these books didn't just write themselves, somebody wrote it, and I'm saying it's Moses. And what you're saying is, no, it wasn't Moses. Well, who was it? The biblical counts get accepted as evidence that this person named Moses existed. And so, I, and then I go into talking about presuppositional apologetics. As far as I can tell, what this has to do with is if I'm talking to somebody who doesn't believe and I'm saying that you need to presuppose something in order to believe, to me, that seems counterproductive. And so I'm not assuming that you need to believe something. But in this case, somebody asked me why I believe. So I'm a believer. So I get to, I'm going to include all of the evidence. You don't want to include that. So you didn't, the, the, the question was never convince me that Moses wrote the Torah. If that's what the question now is, then we can talk a little bit more about that. But my thing to this person is frankly, if you don't believe in the inspiration of the Bible, I don't, I'm, it's not clear to me why you're even talking about this. You already don't believe the Bible is inspired. So, and you probably don't believe in God. So for me, I'm not, it's not clear to me why talk about Moses writing the Torah if you don't believe in God. Because I'm not presuppositional and I'm more of a, from a classical approach of, we begin with the foundation of the existence of God. We then proceed to inspiration of the Bible. And then we get to the deity of Christ as proven by his resurrection from the dead. It's really those three major ideas that we proceed to. And so I think from a presuppositional perspective, you, it doesn't get broken down into those parts. It's kind of like everything at once. And that's just not how I, I view it. And so again, that is not a presuppositional approach to say, um, to say that. And so, so I, that was the big next response. And so next I go, this person says, I expected you to make excuses. So that's not unsurprising. Unsurpri I think they mean that's unsur that's unsurpri unsurprising. Um, footnotes and editorials that are indistinguishable from the main body. You're simply making an assertion. Again, everybody makes assertions. I am asserting that. And you're asserting things. So we're all making assertions. Okay. The author writes of things after his death. That's not simply publishing after the author dies. And it is not a simple editorial note. It is a simple, it, it's a single verse and it's describing Moses and the idea that, um, and yeah, so it is a, a, a brief obituary, you might call it. I mean, if you're, if you're um, listening to this and you're curious about what we're talking about with Deuteronomy 34, it's the final chapter of the Torah. 
And it says here in Deuteronomy 34, 10, but since then, there has not written a, arisen a prophet in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face and all the signs and wonders which the Lord sent him to do in the land of Egypt before Pharaoh, before all his servants in the land, and by, that, by all that mighty power and all the terror which Moses performed in the sight of all Israel. And again, if you even go up higher, it kind of talks about um, these other things where it's, it's speak, it is speaking in, in, the, in the third person. And people say, well, now that couldn't have been Moses writing that. But honestly, Moses easily could have, at 120, wrote the end of this and then and I, again, I don't, I don't tend to think that he wrote probably this in verse 10, but the point is, okay, so maybe there are three or four verses. Maybe you say, I don't think he wrote any of this chapter. Okay. There are 50 chapters in Genesis, 40 chapters in Exodus, 27 chapters in Leviticus. Then you get to the book of Numbers, there's 36 chapters. And then in the book of Deuteronomy, there's 34 chapters. So what you're saying is that maybe, maybe part of, or maybe an entire chapter at the very end of the book, like someone would write an author bio biography or something, frankly, you're talking about something at the very end of the book must mean that he didn't write all those dozens of chapters. You can say that, but again, you have, you, you have the burden of proof there, by the way. So who wrote it? And so. So since you're saying someone else did, I'm saying it was Moses. I'm saying that's what the tradition says. That's what Jesus talked about this being the, the law of Moses or the book of Moses. So you are, or do you have some Jewish scholars that are going like, well, no, there wasn't there really, because I think you were even saying that there wasn't a person named Moses. Okay. So now we, now we get into, okay, where did this book come from? So I, I, I just don't like this idea of claiming this shows as you go or parroting someone else who doesn't realize that the historical evidence and timelines undermine the authorship claim. That's a, that's a big, that's a big assertion there, right? First of all, saying that I don't saying that this is something that I'm making up based on what Deuteronomy 34, 10, it is a simple editorial note. It's talking about, it's, it's, it's a, a biography of Moses. It's basically saying, Hey, this is who Moses was. He was a great prophet in Israel. The idea that that's not a simple note that an editor could make or, or a simple note that a prophet or a scribe later on could write. This is who Moses was at the end. Again, we do the, we do this kind of thing in books all the time, but again, apparently a 3000 year old book, we must not do that. And so you're putting these, you're putting these 21st century sensibilities on it and that's fine. And so what I, what I, I then saw, so you also believe that Methuselah lived for 900 plus years and the planet was flooded. I mean, really? So again, here's what you're doing. You're looking at something that seems unbelievable. And what I'm saying is if you don't believe in God and then you don't establish the inspiration of the scriptures, then that's where, yes, that seems it wasn't just Methuselah. There were more people than him that lived over 900 years. So, and the planet was flooded. But my point is this, if some, if <laughs> what's interesting to me is that if some evolutionary person or, or some evolutionary paleoanthropologist came along and said, wait a minute, there's evidence that people live to be 300 years old, 400 years old. Like you would actually believe that. Like, and that's, that's what's unclear to me. <laughs> Why um, the idea that people used to live longer, let's say, that when we talk about things like genetic entropy, that's a real thing that we see. And so what's, what's unclear, and I'm not saying you would believe it. Maybe you wouldn't. Maybe if an evolutionary paleoanthropologist came along and said, we, we have evidence that people live to be 300 years, that you would just be like, well, no. But my point is the planet was flooded. And what we, we clearly need to talk about the evidence uh, of a global flood. But even if let, let's say there was no evidence and the scriptures tell us that you say, Jerry, why do you believe in the inspiration of the Bible? Okay. We got to, we got to, um, finish, but do you also believe that, um, Methuselah lived for 900 plus years and the planet was flooded? Yes. <laughs> and my, my answer to that is again, 
there are plenty of things in the Bible that seem implausible, but this is where faith comes in. And it's not, again, a blind faith because there are a lot of things in the Bible that have so much. There, there are things like the prophecies of Daniel. When you look at the book of Daniel, you see, okay, Daniel is written. Uh, Daniel would have been an, an, one of the, Babylon, uh, the exiles to Babylon when Nebuchadnezzar, a real king, by the way, um, became. So he would, have, he would have been a young man, an exile to Babylon taken away from his homeland um, in the nation of Judah and taken up to Babylon. And here is, we have the, we have this account in Daniel chapter two, where, where world kingdoms, Babylon, the Medo-Persian empire, Greece, and Rome are predicted. We see this in the book of Daniel. Now, Daniel is written in the 600s to 500s BC. Okay. So, okay, maybe you would have been able to predict the Medo-Persian Empire. Maybe, but likely not. So it's written in the, in the 500s. But then it talks about, it predicts Greece and Rome. And you, can, you, you see a description of Alexander the Great there. Now, what you might say is, well, no, that wasn't written back then. And okay, you, you, can, you can say that. But it, it's things like that that we can look at and those kinds of evidences that are so implausible how do, how does how do you write because there aren't any real there aren't any holy books that really do prophecies like that and so how do you explain this and so you can explain it with well um it wasn't actually written back then but notice the people that say this they already believe the bible is not inspired of god and so there is not a neutrality, and then let's look at the evidence. There is a, I'm on this side against, and so therefore I'm just going to attack all evidence that I see to the contrary. So yes, I believe uh, Methuselah lived for 900 plus years and the planet was flooded. If, if not, then I don't believe this book. And so we've, we've used... Let's talk about faith again, and then I will I will take a look at um, the rest of Manana, um, uh, Mana Mana the Great. I'll look at the rest of that because again, also somebody that works, so I I completely understand. There's not time all day to address these comments, um, but and we haven't even been able to get to the other comments. But let's let's just say here um, that yes, Methuselah was uh lived for 900 years and the planet was flooded yes we'll, we'll we'll deal with the flood at another time but what i would also say to all of you if you do not believe in god i think we should just dwell there and dwell with okay is bay your answer is bay your answer big bang abiogenesis evolution is that your answer because it's easy to try to say stuff about my answer what's your answer and don't and and I don't want to hear stuff about well that's just basic science, it is. Matter, energy, and and time popping into existence, that's science. Non living matter popping life into existence, that's science. Where do you observe that? So so that's that that's that's my question to you. If is it Bay? Is that, is that what you're going with? Because I'm going with God. That's. That uh, lines up more with my scientific training and background. Okay, so uh, here I just basically point out those three main things that he said that, look, Moses' obituary was likely added after his death. Something like Numbers 12.3, have you encountered any scholars of ancient texts that struggle with Moses' use of the third person as much as you do? That, that's a good, that, that's, that's a decent question where, because you're coming up with this idea that, well, um, he uses third person, so it must not be him. But that's a that's a 21st century approach. And I'm just I haven't encountered that. Maybe there are scholars that say that, and uh, I'll be interested to see. So and then the historical evidence and timelines undermine the authorship claim. What historical evidence are you talking about? And how would that undermine undermine the claim of Moses as the author of the Torah specifically? So I think they're answering next. 
I'm currently at work, so I'll address each point as time permits, starting with the last one. You presuppose the author, Moses, wrote it by your own admission because an anonymous author wrote that someone told him that Jesus said so without or before examining all the available evidence that is relevant to the issue of the claim that Moses wrote it, and then attacking all other possibilities by inferring edits and dismissing contextual problems, then admitting your ignorance of the historicity problems, you're indeed performing a... What historicity problems? And so this, so this is the thing. Nobody knows everything about everything. <laughs> Nobody knows everything about a topic. And so what happens here is you're attacking me. And what I'm saying is an anonymous author wrote that someone told him that Jesus said so. So I, again, this is, I mean, I, I, I mentioned a couple of different passages, I believe Mark and Luke. So Mark and Luke uh, wrote those books. And so that is, that's that. So here's the difficulty here. I'm, I'm not presupp. I was being asked. So again, this gets back to, this gets back to misunderstanding or presuppositional apologetics. You asked me why I believe this. And because I, because I believe this and I put way more stock in the Bible than I do in all of these other things. And you, you have your assumptions that you're going to make for you. You basically say, well, who, and without or before examining all the available evidence that is ish relevant to the issue of the claim that Moses wrote it. So I want you to think about what you sound like right now, because we, we likened this to the husband who is married to a wife and someone says, you really think your wife is faithful? And he says, yes, I've seen this and I've seen this. And the person comes back with, well, you haven't looked at all of the relevant evidence that is relevant to the issue that your wife is unfaithful. And the husband's like, what? And that's, and that's honestly where I am right now, where you're asking me as a believer, why I trust that Moses wrote the book and you're coming back at me as if I should approach it as if I'm neutral or as if I'm not. And you're saying that's presuppositional, but it's not presuppositional because I'm a believer. When we're talking about apologetics, we're talking about talking to someone who is an unbeliever. Now, if you had said to me, Hey, explain to me why I should believe Moses should be the, Moses is the author then I would not say because Luke and Mark said so. That's the difference here. So, so that entire presuppositional point is not even really a point here. What we're, we're ult ultimately saying is if you ask me, my answer is not the same as an answer that I would give you to help you understand. No, I would not quote Mark and Luke for that. If you were a believer in the Bible, I would, but I assume that you're not. But all the person was asking me was, did I believe it? So for example, if someone asks me, do I believe that Methuselah lived to be 969 years old? Do I believe that there was a global flood? Yes. Now, if you say to me, prove it. Now, again, once again, we've got to go back to, do you believe in God? Because I don't know why you're having these discussions if you don't even believe in God. I don't know if you do. So let's say you do. Okay, now we can talk about zoom out. What? Why is it that Jerry trusts the Bible like this? Now we can talk about that and then get into specific issues of, of let's say difficult texts, although these aren't difficult texts, but you're asking me about the difficult text and we haven't established what you believe. So I'm not trying to convince you. I'm saying what my reasoning is. And so for me who trust the inspiration of the scripture, if I have a scripture elsewhere that claims that Moses wrote this, I can use that. But if I'm trying to convince you, that's what apologetics is. Apologetics is not about somebody who already believes. Apologetics is about someone who does not believe. And so I'm not presupposing anything when I'm talking to you. But if someone in a comment who doesn't say anything about background just simply asks me, do I believe that Moses wrote it? And I say, yes, and here's why, because I believe the scripture. I don't know if you're, I have believers on here. I have atheists on here. I have agnostics on here. I have all kinds of people. So if you ask me why I specifically believe, that's not a that's not an apologetics thing. That's a, this is why I believe. Just like if you ask the husband, does he believe his wife is faithful? His answer to why he believes that is not based on, well, I got a private investigator and I've been following her around and stalking her and that's how I know she's faithful. And if you required him to do that, that would be weird.
And so, no, is he looking for her unfaithfulness? No, he's not. And what you're trying to get me to do is say, you believe in the Bible, but what you ought to do is you ought to spend a lot of time looking at all of the evidence that's to the contrary of it. But that's just like telling the husband who believes his wife is faithful to look at, to get a private investigator. He already believes she's faithful. Does, is, has he been given some reason not to? And so, for example, you, you haven't said very much except third person and Deuteronomy 34.10. And I've given you pretty simple reasons as to why that's not even anything that's to worry about. And then this historical evidence. And I say, what historical evidence are you talking about? And your answer to that is, well, you, you're ignorant of the historicity problems. What historicity problems? So it's not, not a presuppositional approach. I'm telling you why I believe. I'm not so if if this is now a discussion of why you should believe, oh come on, like <laughs> we got to get out of here. So if you're telling me why you believe or why I this is why I don't believe, I'm going to again go back to do you believe in God? Do you believe in the inspiration of the scriptures? If you do not, both of those are prior to talking about Moses writing the, the Torah. They're both prior to that. So us, we, we're just going to go around in circles. So let's go, let's go back to wherever we need to go. And if it's back to, I don't even believe in God, we don't need to talk about Moses in the Torah because for what it doesn't even, it's not even relevant. You don't even believe God existed. So it'd be very easy for you to not believe Moses existed. So that's what I would say. I'll say, Hey, let's, let's go back to there. So, um, yeah, this is not a presuppositional approach because I'm not doing apologetics here. I'm telling you why I believe. And then you asked me if any textual scholars have problems with it. I didn't ask if any textual scholars have problems with it. What I asked is, have you encountered any that struggle with his use with the third person as much as you do? Meaning, are there people that look at the third person and say, well, he must not have written it then? Are there textual scholars doing that? Aside from the fact that footnotes and editorials prove it was at least in part written by, okay, so this is what we're getting at. Was it at least in part written by someone else? Sure. But we don't say, like, again, if, if, if that piece was written by someone else, I'm willing to concede that, but you're, do I then say he didn't write the Torah because there was somebody that wrote a, a piece at the end? <laughs> Well, Moses did, and I have to list off, uh, and, 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 and by the way, we don't know that, and I don't know for sure, by the way, there are some people, I will say this, you're not going to like it, but there are some people that believe, no, no, he wrote that too. Well, that, that's ridiculous. Well, no, there's some people that think, believe he wrote that. My point is, even whether he wrote that piece at the very end of the Torah or not, he wrote the Torah. And nobody would say, well... When you're asking somebody who wrote who wrote this book and somebody wrote a blurb at the end about the author, nobody includes that. Nobody includes that. In 21st century, nobody includes that. If somebody wrote some blurb about you. In fact, when people write, oh, so, so, well, th this would be different having a foreword or something. They will generally say that. But even then, nobody says that the person that wrote the foreword wrote the book, right? They might say that this person wrote the foreword. But again, we're talking about 3000 plus years ago. So what I would say is if there were some kind of editorial statement or some kind of footnote, but he's writing 99.9% .9 of the book, I mean, what, what are you at? You're asking me to, to now say that he didn't write it. And that's the part that just doesn't make sense. So it being third person doesn't help my argument. I'm not saying it doesn't help my argument. It being third person is what you're saying. And I'm saying, are there any textual scholars that have problems with that? How many ancient autobiographical works? It's not an autobiographical work. So then, so again, I'm, I'm curious if you've read it now. The Torah is not an autobiography. If you had examples, perhaps you might have a basis for an argument. No, 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 no. I don't need an argument. You're attacking the authorship of Moses. Various people have said Moses wrote it, and those people clearly don't look at the third person as a problem. I certainly hadn't thought much about the third person as being a problem at all, because it has nothing to do with whether you wrote it or not.
when a person speaks in third person, it doesn't mean they didn't say what they just said because they use third person. We kind of laugh about it and go, oh, you're talking in third person now, but it doesn't mean they didn't say what they just said. And so now you're saying, I need to have some examples. Again, all of this stems back from you asked me if I believe, or it wasn't even you, I think it was Daniel T. I think Daniel T asked me, did I really believe that Moses wrote Genesis? And so then you say, well, it doesn't bother me, that third person. No, third person does not bother me. Does it bother me that there is a piece of text at the end that describes Moses? That sounds like probably someone else wrote it. No, it doesn't. Because that, what does that have to do with the other 99.9% .9 of the Torah? It doesn't have anything to do with it. And so, so now because of a couple of verses, you're saying, I need to have some examples. I'm saying you need to have some examples. You need to have some examples of third person being a problem. You're assuming it's a problem, but you have no examples to show that it's a problem. But the question you should be asking yourself is outside of traditional claims and blind belief in circular claims, as you said, was good enough for you. Yeah. So, so this is where it's difficult because what you just did, what evidence is there? He write it at all. And what's the textual scholarship consensus on whether he or not he did? Not the consensus among theologians based on what is claimed in the New Testament, but by historians and textual scholars with the archaeological evidence in mind. That being, there is no evidence to corroborate the Exodus story, and all the evidence we do have doesn't support it. You all saw what I said. What historical evidence are you referring to? And how would it undermine the claim of Moses, author of the Torah? No manna manna. The great, all due respect. That's that's the question. Where is it? The other question. You have any author, you have any scholars of the ancient texts that have a problem with third person? So what do you do? You tell me I need to go find something. I'm not the one say, saying he didn't write it. You are. And since you're saying he didn't write it, where is your evidence that third person is a problem? I'm saying it's not. And I'm saying, can you show me author? Can you show me ancient texts where they go, oh, oh, there's third person here. So he must not have written it. I see you saying it. Where's the scholarship behind what you're saying? And then what do you say? So you're telling me what the question I should be asking myself. I don't have any, I don't have the questions. You're the person. So again, I'm saying you're trying to tell me what I should be asking myself. And I've already asked you those questions. Let's repeat. Here are the questions. Have you encountered any scholars of ancient texts that uh, have you encountered any scholars of ancient texts that struggle with the Moses use of the third person as much as you do? That's a question. Is the third person the problem that you say it is? Because you're saying it's a problem, but I don't think you're a, a scholar of ancient texts. But what you're now telling me to do is go find some ancient texts that use third person. That's not the point. You need to find some that don't, or you need to find scholars that study those that say, oh, but based on this, we can't, we can't say that Moses wrote it. And I haven't seen it. I haven't seen you give this. You say that there's historical evidence and timelines that undermine the authorship claim. Simple question. What historical evidence? Now I'm looking, I'm looking at your comments. Maybe you want to do it in email or something else. I'm looking, but what you're saying to me is that I need to go find that. Why would I find that? Moses wrote it. Now, if you're going to say he didn't, then where, where is this, uh, this evidence that third person is a problem? And where is this historical evidence that undermines the claims that Moses wrote it? Those are your two, that's, that's your homework <laughs> for tonight um, or for whenever. And so, no, there are no, there are no mental gymnastics on your part. So again, you you, you can say things are excuses. You can defend a position that is based on a fundamentally flawed rationale, which shows that your evidentiary bar is egregiously low and that you are more willing to engage in presuppositional apologetics or a defense for presupposition than to fact check the story against. You came out <laughs> on my channel and said all of these things and presented no evidence. So where is it? I'm telling you my position. But the, the problem here is, and, and here's, and I'm going to end with 
this right here, blatant dishonesty, uh, misinformation, speculation, assumptions, ignorance, and wishful thinking, zero factual evidence. I expect nothing less from a religious person. Okay. <laughs> right. But I want you to think about the fact, uh, are there more replies here has been attributed as not a strong argument. I'm not thinking. Uh, B Daniel. Okay. So clearly, um, we're going to have to address this particular issue. Well, that's the thing. I can't address this prior to talking about belief in God. And so I wasn't making a strong argument. This is the thing that, that people are asking me why I believe something. And now you're saying I need to make the strongest argument possible, but I wasn't trying to make a strong argument. I really wasn't. Like if you're saying, give me the strongest argument you have, that wasn't the question. I want you all to go back and see what the original question was and what my responses were. Do you really think Moses wrote Genesis? Yes. People have been attributing this to Moses for thousands of years. And some people recently have questioned that. Jesus calls the Torah the book of Moses. And that's enough for me. It doesn't mean that's the only thing I understand. And that's the thing that's being, so now you're, so then man, man comes after me and it is like, again, you're asking me why I believe this is not a, these comments are not about apologetics. This is not about, can, can you explain to me why I should believe Moses? Now that's a different question. If you had said to me, can you explain to me why I should believe that Moses wrote the Torah? Now that's a different question, but you're asking me why I do. And so I, yeah, I would just say here has not, has been attributed as not a strong argument. I wasn't meaning for a strong argument. I was simply meaning to answer according to this again, saying to the husband, well, we've been married for 50 years. It's not a strong argument. <laughs> He's like, okay, I'm just telling you why I believe my wife is faithful. And you want me to give you like private investigator files and you want me to have stalked her. And I'm just telling you why I trust my wife. And when I'm talking about why I believe that Moses wrote the Bible, now you're not, you didn't, I was not asked, um, can you give me the strongest arguments you have? Because I don't believe that. That's not what I was asked. I was asking why I trust that Moses wrote the Torah. And that's what I answered. And now people are jumping in and saying, that's not a strong argument. I wasn't meaning to make a strong argument, but should I do a video on that comment? Comment on this one. Should I do a video specifically on Moses writing the Torah? Even if I did, I think I would need a series first. I think we would need to talk about the existence of God first, the inspiration of the Bible next, and then we could talk about Moses writing the Torah. Like there, there's, there's a, a progression here. So, so yeah, it, it was, if you go back and see the progression of these comments, that's what it was. Um, yes. Uh, be insulting to me, <laughs> Carl White. Um, thanks for the comment, but I, I just, I don't know what's in people's hearts that they come on a channel like this and want to be insulting. I, I don't know what that is, but Okay. So again, there are no mental gymnastics. This was really actually straightforward. And what I said is, okay, what's your evidence for the stuff you're saying? Because he's the one that said that there's historical evidence and then presented zero. So maybe there's some coming. And if there's something coming, then I can address that. But again, the man's going to want to know, okay, you're saying my wife is unfaithful. Can you, do you have some picture of her with somebody else? Well, all the evidence says she's unfaithful. Um, what evidence? You, you should be looking for the evidence that she's unfaithful. Uh, what? <laughs> no, my wife is faithful. And, um, I mean, we had dinner together last night. Well, that doesn't mean anything. It's like, okay, and this is what you're doing here. All due respect. I believe in the inspiration of the scriptures. I know that Moses wrote the Torah. And if you ask me why I think that I'm going to base my answer on that. If you're wanting to know why you should believe that I'm not going to use the same approach, but you ask me why I think it. So if you ask me why I think it, I'm going to tell you the true answer. Okay. So, so again, I don't like things like telling me I'm not going to be intellectually honest. I don't like it. 
I'll let you say it. I don't like it, of course, because if we're going to talk about intellectual honesty, where is your evidence? And if you don't like my answer, that's fine. But trying to tell me that um, I'm, there's some kind of fundamentally flawed rationale, you are already making excuses. So you can keep calling things excuses. Where is your evidence? And I think we're going to stop there. It's like an hour and a half. <laughs> That's enough of this. Um, so I do need to go back and I'll probably do maybe another video responding to the response video, but this was fun. That this is, this is all for, um, for this one. And so for those of you who are going to comment on this one or on this video, like comment on this one. And then we'll just kind of leave these comments as they are maybe. But what I would, again, what I would say is telling me I'm going to be intellectually dishonest, right? Because now that gives you an out because now you're going to, well, you're just not being honest. And I'm saying to you, I already asked you. And I have to, uh, I have to assume that the answer is no, you haven't encountered any scholars. You're just coming up with something. I have to, I have to assume that you're just saying that there's, his, there's historical evidence that undermines the authorship claim. But then you're telling me I need to go find it. Okay. Yeah. Go tell the man that believes his wife is faithful to go look for some evidence against her. And he's going to look at you like, well, why would I do that? And, and go tell that man that if you really wanted to think that she was faithful, what you really should have done is gotten a private investigator to prove that she was faithful. And he would look at you like, what? I don't have any reason to do that. And quite frankly, third person and Deuteronomy 3410 really isn't a reason to now go. And I, and, and I didn't say the thing I was going to say. So let me say that. And then we really need to be done. One of the things you did here is you somehow elevated historians and textual scholars and archaeological evidence above theologians. So there's a clear bias here. And so what happens is you want me to have the same bias that you do. And I don't. But my point is, show me the historians. Show me the textual scholars who are struggling with the third person. Show me this historical evidence of which you claim. You can sit around and tell me that I'm unfamiliar with the... Uh, where, where did it say that, that I, because I'm unfamiliar with the historical evidence, um, that that's a problem. Where does it say that? Um, so yeah, I, yeah. Oh yeah. It was, uh, you need to fact check the story against the evidence, but see, again, there's all the, the only evidence is evidence essentially that would be against the position. So, so only one set of evidence is, is allowed only the evidence that says it's not true. And so we, we're not going to look at any other evidence. So th that's where we'll, that's where we'll stop for today. Man, of man of the great, this is a good discussion here. And so what I would again say is now we are talking about why you don't believe that Moses wrote the Torah. And since we are, cause you've inserted yourself into this, then here's what you need to do. Show us those scholars that struggle with third person and show us this historical evidence that you said, what are you talking about? But don't tell me to go find it. <laughs> right? So, so this thing is, uh, don't tell me to go find. Yeah. Of the, here it is. It, your ignorance of the historicity problems. No, don't go. Don't you say there are historicity problems. I say there's not now go find whatever historicity problems you're referring to. And then I can answer that, but don't tell me there are some, and then I need to go find them. You go find them. But I haven't, I, there's no evidence here. You didn't, there was nothing said here. Just, just attacking me. I'm not intellectually honest. You can attack me, but, but ad hominem in my experience, ad hominem is because there's no evidence. All this, where's your evidence? All these things that are being said here are no, no, there's no mental gymnastics necessary, right? 
There's no like there. And so please, where's the evidence? And if you don't mind less of the attacks, the personal attacks, right? We're talking about ideas and but I can't tell you to stop tell, calling me dishonest and lying, but uh, okay. That's all for today. We will probably do a, a response video to the other response video from Tuesday, but until then we'll see you next time.